I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Who knows where you're going to go because you showed up there? Right. It seems to me that curiosity is blocked off when you just tell somebody this is what you have to do this is where you have to go right and that's what really gets me right this happens in every area of life like if you're 45 years old if i just hit senior vp and get that you know extra options at my job then i'll be okay for the next five years and then i'll consider retiring or changing but every all the time We have choices to do what we're more passionate about. And then you think, well, but I'm not good at it. But then you could figure out, you can always do these little experiments on hundreds and hundreds of things to find out what you're passionate about. No self-help book talks about any of this. And I think it's a real shame because these are the things that people need now. We're we're living in a, a world of not only innovation, but invention. You have to reinvent to, to, to be happy. You kind of have to change your life a few times. We're living to be old ages now. So this is James Alvacher taking over Cal Fussman's podcast for the first 20 seconds. Cal, how's it been going? It's been spectacular. What's uh, Who are some recent guests you've had on? Well, I had on Lou DiBella. My old semi-buddy, my old acquaintance from my HBO days HBO 20 years ago. Boxing. So you, you were telling me that you set up their first website. Yeah, they're, so their first... Uh, first website, well, not only HBO.com, but HBO Boxing. And then my wife, she would be on the web in real time, an announcer on the website for all the fights. You're kidding. She would do it for the for the website. So we set up the website and she, uh, my company, and she did it. And she was a former female flyweight Golden Gloves champ in New York. And that's how, and that's, and she was, that's this how, is amazing. That's I how didn't she knew Lou DiBella. Yeah. So she knew Lou DiBella and then she would introduce me to Lou DiBella and that's how I knew Lou. And is she taking you to the gym? Is she still working out? What? Well, well, we're, we haven't been married for a long time, but she is the mother of my two children, so I see her occasionally. And but yeah, she's always she's still into fighting. I mean, she doesn't. She uh, after she won the flyweight for Golden Gloves, uh, which just to be clear is like I don't know, 110 pounds, something like that. 12, I think. Yeah, I don't yeah. want anybody to think she's like 160 pounds and like beating the crap out of me all the time. <laughs> But uh, she had an opportunity to be pro, but it wasn't that many opportunities for women uh, to be pro. And she was worried about, you know, going blind and breaking a nose and all those things. And that can happen. Yeah. She had already a detached retina from the boxing. So. I know quite a few people that happened too. Yeah. So I'm glad she's happy and healthy. Yeah, and you know New York, so you probably know the gym where she trained at. Um, 
Gosh, I was it Gleason's? Wasn't Gleason's? Also, she spent some Times time. Square in, Gym. The, the Times Square Gym. That's where I trained to oh. fight Julio Cesar Chavez. Uh, what, what, uh, was Geraldo also tra- training in that gym? It was above, like Port, right next to Port of Thales. Yeah, that's exactly there. Yeah, yeah. So she said like there was all sorts of people who were training there, and um, she would do that. And then when I met her, it was on like Twenty Seventh Street. She was training King's Gym or something. Never went to that one. It was like a, a father son. The father was a big coach. The son was a, a fighter. Didn't know that. And then one. he had a patch. He he also had a detached retina. Ultimately, um, Michael Kings. I don't know. Oh, uh, Oluwande. Might be. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. But the the Times Square one. She trained at all the time. That's when she was getting her golden gloves. All right. Well, we're off to a great start here. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we just had this amazing conversation coming up in the elevator uh, about the direction of podcasting. Uh, the direction of your podcast, the direction of my podcast. And also, you have a fantastic idea on a book going forward that just had my head spinning. Oh, and great. That's what that's I, good news. And that's what I really want to talk about because I think you have burrowed down very deeply into something that can change my life because – I've been going in the direction I think you're talking about, and it works. It works. That's the amazing thing. And it's not, there's all this like BS self-help uh, stuff out there where they kind of just regurgitate prior academic studies and then they pass them around like, oh, this is what happens when you're vulnerable. This is what happens when you're grateful. This is what happens when you when you win the morning, you know, like all these kind of catchphrases and, and, but, but, when you sit and think about it, life is hard. Like every day you wake up and you figure out what can I do next? How can I get better? How can I not only get better? How can I just stay level with where I was yesterday? Because it's the world. And this isn't a pessimistic view, but like take podcasts. We've been doing them for a long time. You've been interviewing people forever, but now there's 2 million interview podcasts out there. And so you have to constantly ask yourself, well, gosh, I don't want to just be one of 2 million. Then just the law of numbers, eventually it's going to sink, you know, in the long run, somehow or other, there's going to be enough good interviewers out there that you have to figure out how, what makes you different, what makes it so that people are going to want to share what you have to say. And so all the time you have to be experimenting. What can I do? What can I take a chance at that no one else is willing to take a chance at? How can I be better? How can I do what I love doing instead of just trying to scramble to get the latest celebrity with a book out? And those interviews are the most boring. And this is exactly where I was at. And I, I started to know it. I'm really glad we're having this conversation because I, I get like a lot of emails from publicists and they're pitching books and books could be really relevant, could be great. And they're pitching them in terms of these are the talking points uh, as if, okay, you're going to interview the author and this is what you're going to get. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want to know what I'm going to get. Right. And, and, and right. And so there's this path in each category and not just podcasts. We're really talking about any category. Like if you want to be a great salesperson, people say, well, you got to start off selling, you know, these small little, you know, computer systems, or you have to, uh, you know, every area you want to be good at, People are first going to tell you, well, you can't just jump to the top. Who do you think you are? Or they'll say, well, you don't know anything yet. You have to be in this for 10 years before you can start doing, (laughs) before you can start writing a column for Esquire magazine. You should be doing this for 15 years. You can't skip the line. And, or, or you started a job and you have some ideas. Well, you can't just be a VP. You're, you're the bottom of the chain. You can't be at the top yet. You're too young. Even though your ideas are the best, we're just going to seal them all. So everyone's kind of going, or let's say you are the top of the chain, but you just want a life change because. Because it's going to lift you in, in a different direction. Right. Or lift you straight up by going to a different direction. We only, I mean, it's a cliche to say this, but we really do only have one life. And most of the time we're just trying to survive it and fee- pay for our family. And we're scared those moments when we think we can not pay and we try to avoid that fear. But at the same time, the way you best 
can succeed is to experiment with lots of new ideas, figure out where your passions lie. And then there are tools so that everyone who says, oh, you can't skip the line. You can't get better at this unless you pay your dues. There are tools to skip the line and, and without paying the dues. Not to say cheat, but can I give you a small example? This is like a trivial example. Okay. But like, I have two kids applying to college. Now, of course, I don't want either of them to go to college. I have another kid who just dropped out of college. <laughs> oh, Thank you, Josie, for dropping out of college. You're doing the right thing. I want to reinforce that. But my my kids, they, they're like, I saw them senior year. Like one of my kids, literally two in the morning, I'd be like downstairs. You know, I'd wake up. What are you doing? It's two in the morning. And she's, she's like crying. I got to finish my homework. And there's like tears dripping on her textbook. And I'm like, well, why do you have to do this? And she's like, well, I'm not going to get into college if I don't do this. And I said, do you think, you know, there, there are a million 17 year old girls like you right now in the New York city area, trying over their homework, trying to get into the exact same college. that's only going to accept a thousand people. You're not going to get into the college you want. And, and I said to her, and this is what I would say to anybody. There's always other ways to get to the top of what you want to get to the top at. And so I'll just give college as an example is let's say you want your kid to go into Harvard and your kid has a 3.9 GPA like everyone else, plays one sport three days a week like everyone else, does charity work a little bit. He or she is not going to get into college. Every other kid, a million other kids in the area are doing it. And so I said to, I, I said to my kid and she didn't do it this way, but you want to get into a college, take a year off, uh, hang out at NASCAR races, you know, first work on a pit crew, then, then get, take that, then get into a car, put on the uniform and race in a NASCAR race. Now you're the 18 year old girl who professionally races in NASCAR races. You're going to get into any college you want then. Cause you're the only one doing it. And by the way, you might not even want it. You might decide you love NASCAR races then. And that's right. Who knows where you're going to go because you showed up there. Right. Maybe the college of your dreams the year before is no longer very important. Right. Like, let's say you want to play in poker tournaments. You love poker. And now you're the 18-year-old girl and you're on, you win third prize in Monte Carlo. And then you win ninth prize in Las Vegas. And now you apply. And like, here's what I learned from you know, competing at the highest level against pros in all these professional poker places. Again, you'll get into college, but you might decide, you know what? I just made $75,000 this past year. Maybe I'll keep doing it and improving. And, and if you want to go to college, that's yeah. great. <laughs> but here's the thing. It seems to me that curiosity is blocked off when you just tell somebody, this is what you have to do. This is where you have to go. Right. And that's what really gets me. Right. Like uh, you're told you can't take that year off. You can't, you have to go to college or else you're not going to get a job. And guidance counselors are trained to say that to kids. We're, I know we're sticking with the college metaphor and it applies to so many others, but, but this happens kind of in every area of life. Guidance counselors are trained to tell the kids, well, you look, you need to go to college, even if it's the worst college in the world, because you won't get a job afterwards. They have to say that because their funding is often based on what percentage of kids go to college. So there's a whole kind of institutional paradigm that the kids are getting swept up into. Oh, but then I have to borrow money and then I have to work at a job to pay off that money. And then they're trapped into this cycle. And not, you, you would think, oh, every kid needs to listen to this, but this happens in every area of life. Like if you're 45 years old, if I just hit senior VP and get that, you know, extra options at my job, then I'll be okay for the next five years. And then I'll consider retiring or changing. But every, all the time we have choices to do what we're more passionate about. And then you think, well, but I'm not good at it. But then you could figure out, well, let's say you're passionate about sports. Like, you know, you love boxing. I love boxing. You're not going to be a professional boxer. No. But you could write, you could do podcasts about boxing. You could do blogs about boxing. You could have set up fantasy boxing leagues. You could do statistics on boxing, you know, and be like sort of these sabermetrics people in the, uh, you know, money ball, Michael Lewis's money ball for baseball. One could do for boxing. You could, uh, you know, there's so many, it's what I call the spoken wheel approach. The wheel is your interest in boxing, 
But then there's probably 40 spokes outside of that wheel. And each one you could be- experiment in very easily to see, huh, was this interesting to me? Can I double down on this to make it even more interesting or lucrative? Or I mentioned the example with uh, a kid playing poker. Well, it costs nothing really to play in your first poker tournament, just the entry fee. And if you don't like it, stop. If you like it, play the second one. If you like it more, take some lessons from a professional poker player, read some books, watch some videos. If you like it again, travel a bit to even a more sophisticated poker tournament. So you, so you can always do these little experiments on hundreds and hundreds of things to find out what you're passionate about. And then there are techniques further. Oh, I want to get good at this. I want to get good at this spoke. Uh, here's how I do it. And there's techniques for that. No self-help book talks about any of this. And I think it's a real shame because these are the things that people need now. We're, we're living in a, a world of, of not only innovation, but invention. You have to reinvent to, to, to be happy. You kind of have to change your life a few times. We're living to be old ages now. Yeah, I have completely reinvented myself in the last three, three and a half years. Yeah, you were editor-at-large at Esquire writing 600-word interviews with Mikhail Gorbachev and now preeminent podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about preeminent, but I'm eminent. having a lot of fun. Eminent. <laughs> eminent. <laughs> not only pre, but not yet post. <laughs> oh, but look what happened to me because I was actually asked to speak once uh, on a ship for entrepreneurs. I'd never really spoken to entrepreneurs or spoken very much. And I'd been an interviewer for 20 years. People knew me as a magazine writer. And then I got up on one day and spoke to about a couple hundred entrepreneurs in a beautiful room. When I got done, it was a standing ovation and my life completely changed. Because uh, coronavirus was on that ship and it was quarantined (laughs) and they had to amputate a leg. (laughs) It changed because there was a long line of people who were waiting to meet me after the talk, including a monk who came up and said, how, how long have you been speaking? And I said, this is the first time. And he said, oh, you, you've got to do this. You, you have to do it. And he said, I speak for a living and I'm, I'm going to help you because I just want to see you do well. And that set me off on a path to speak. Then I started to speak and I go to a hospital and I'm speaking at this hospital and I notice this hospital has amazing stories. In fact, if you're a storyteller, there's probably no more fertile place on the planet than a hospital because there are miracles going on there every day. And I find out that even the people who work in the hospital don't know their hospital's own stories. Yeah, I can believe that because a lot of them are kind of rotating through many hospitals. They also never stay attached to the stories of the patients because they're just rotating through the little slivers of the lives of these patients. You know, two hours on the night shift, three hours on the Tuesday shift, you know. Some do become very close and keep in touch, but there's so much going on. And here's the thing. There's all these HIPAA laws, privacy laws. So it's inculcated in their heads, like uh, silence. But that silence doesn't allow the other people in the hospital to know the amazing things that are going on. Yeah. And I think it, it actually hurts the hospital for its own employees not to know who they who they are as a congregation accumulation of people and so that led me to start helping hospitals tell their stories and now i'm in a completely different place and then when i started to look into that i said oh my god doctors are committing suicide every day I mean, every day in America, a doctor commits suicide, like if you do the numbers. And that got me to start to think, that man, these doctors are in rough 
places because they cannot be vulnerable. You tell me, in what other job in America can you not make a mistake? I mean, uh, airplane pilot. Okay, there you go. <laughs> they can't be vulnerable. They can't be vulnerable either. Uh, but it's true. You're, you're right because, you know, and there's so much, I don't want to say malpractice because it's not intentional, but there are a lot of cases where doctors do make mistakes and, and, and bad if, things happen. And if that's the case, then the person or the family should be compensated for it. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, but you have doctors who basically have to be flawless and, or have to be seen as flawless. And that is not a healthy place to be for, for anybody. No. And then I think also there's a lot of jobs. First off, doctors can't be, uh, they can't make mistakes because lives are at stake. But I think in general, most people think at their jobs, they can't make mistakes because they might get fired. They might get passed up for a promotion. All these things that are kind of instrumental in how they live their lives and support their families. They're afraid to make mistakes. Think about a financial advisor. If you go on CNBC and make a prediction, pretty much just like anybody else, you have a 50, 50 chance of that prediction coming through, but there's all like nobody makes admits to making mistakes. On, you never see someone go on some business show and say, yep, I was wrong. Well, what do you think now? <laughs> Beats me. I have, do you, do you know, have, have a caller call in and tell us. <laughs> no one says that. Think of what it must be like for a doctor because they cannot be seen as vulnerable in any way. When the patient walks in, they expect to be healed. Yeah. And they expect the doctor to be perfect especially like a surgeon. Uh, and the, the reality is that I, th I, I believe doctors need to find places where they can be vulnerable, where they can let some of the air out of this balloon. And so now I'm going to do some of that. Well, you know, and think about it. Vulnerability is, is, is like a currency for freedom. So when you're vulnerable, suddenly the world of things you can talk about, and the world of people who want to talk to you grows. You just, you just made a transaction. I'm giving this currency of my vulnerability, and now I'm more free. I can move in larger circles. I can talk to more people. I people, more people are going to relate to me. Now, some people are going to criticize, like how did, he can't say that. But those are the people who are trying to keep you in prison in the first place. He can't say that. So now, vulnerability is directly connected to the freedom in your life, and I think. Most people don't, unfortunately, don't realize that. Could you ever trust somebody who is not vulnerable to you? No. And in fact, I mean, and look, there's always stories. I'm going through this right now where there's a business I'm involved in where I found out a situation where the CEO really didn't have to miss. He didn't misrepresent something, but he omitted something in telling some basic fact to me. And I think to myself, that's a one strike and you're out kind of thing because, you know, if I'm trusting someone that I'm going to invest in their idea and their business and their livelihood, they need to be honest with me. And, and you know, I can't trust them if they're not. There, yeah, there you go. I mean, honesty and vulnerability, you can't separate them. Right. And related to that, you know, is what you were saying about hospitals. Like many hospitals don't even know their own stories. And I find there are, and it's such a basic thing. I find there are many people who are professionals that don't know the history of their profession. They don't know the biographies of the great people in their profession. They don't know the stories of their clients. They don't know the stories of their employees. And I think these are just such basic fundamental errors. This is like sort of the baseline. It's, we're not even getting to the point where you can be good at something yet. These are like the basics of, of, finding a passion, flourishing in it, understanding it, and taking the basic steps so you could be the best at whatever you love. And it's so easy. It's so easy to listen to those stories, to find them, to search them out. Well, what I'm finding amazing, even as I'm listening to myself talk, that because I made that trip to the ship and got up to speak, uh, now I'm in places where I actually find myself selling what I do, which yeah. I never, 
ever did as a journalist, you, you weren't allowed to do that. And that has made me a, a smarter, more complex person because I took the step. Yeah, you, 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 you made meta what you were doing. So before you were telling stories and people were responding to it. And now you realize, huh, there's this organizational that the whole community of people I spoke to, we all benefited from this storytelling. So that becomes almost this conceptual product that only you're able to offer. And you saw the benefits of it. There were concrete benefits. So you're able to say, okay, this is what I offer. Beyond just me telling my stories, I can also catalyze the way we're all telling stories. And that's going to make the organization or the team or the population here better as a result. Yeah, I, it's hard for me to imagine that any business would not be improved if s somebody went in and just helped everybody understand all the stories that are circulating around this, this business because so many connections are going to come out of that. Yeah. So much learning. Uh, and yet, quite often, you, you see that people who are in the sales department who actually have to sell the company are out of the loop with the people who are doing things in another part of the company that can be sold. This is, this is really important. Like I remember, so you were, you talked about in the beginning of this podcast, you talked about how earlier today you were talking to Lou DiBella, who was the head of boxing at HBO when I was there in the mid nineties. That's right. And I remember when he left, actually he was working for what's his name? Seth Abrams. Seth Abraham. Yeah. Seth Abraham. Yeah. And, uh, I remember when Lou left to start his own, boxing agency. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but why would I, even, so my title at HBO at the time, I was a junior analyst programmer in the IT department. So <laughs> I cannot imagine you as a junior analyst of anything. So, <laughs> so I was sitting in my little cubicle and I would hear everybody in the six cubicles around me. It was like little six by six cubicle. And I had a boss who had a boss who had a boss, 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 who was the CEO of HBO. So then you go down another, completely other, another route, uh, this, you know, original programming, then Seth at sports, then Lou DeBello. So you had to, so he was like a, a sixth qu cousin twice removed to get from me in the organizational <laughs> chart to Lou DeBello. But because I was fascinated by HBO, I made it a point to meet and learn from all, like people would tell me, you can't do that. I'd be you know, leaving the department, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to visit Jeff Bukas's office, the CEO. You can't do that. He's the CEO. You can't just walk into this his office. It's over your head. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and I'm like, well, why can't I do it? I have something important to say to him. <laughs> and that's why you became James. It could be like, then I remember I said to him, you know, just like HBO does original programming, you know, there's these new original TV shows, like at the time, the Larry Sanders show and all these shows. I said, why don't we do original web shows? So I had just finished making HBO's website. And I said, let's, let's, I said to Jeff Bugis, let's make a web series. And he said, you do whatever you want to do, do go for it. <laughs> and so I did, I made an original web series. I called it 3am. We only put it on the website and it was me for three years interviewing people at three in the morning on a Tuesday night in New York city. Hey, you're out at three in the morning on a Tuesday night. What the heck are you doing? Like, that's Why? crazy. And there was insane stories every week. I did it every single week for about two and a half years. And so you were just roving around at 3 a.m. looking yeah. for people. Yeah, like I had a camera person, an audio person. And and then, like, let's say you and your girlfriend were having a fight on Avenue C and 6th <laughs> Street, which is like a bad drug yeah. dealing area at 3 in the morning. You know, you're having a screaming fight. And I'm, I would just go up to you, hey, what are you guys fighting about? <laughs> oh, man. And sometimes, I wish I could go back and see these shows. I kind of wish I could do now. Like, I, I can't believe what I did, some of the things. And, uh, you know, either they would, you know, scream things at me or they would just tell me, like, I found this girl's card in his wallet and he can't seem to explain why it's there. <laughs> That was an actual <laughs> conversation. Or I would I would go on the, there was a bus that goes from this one stop in Queens to this one, to Rikers Island, and it goes 24 hours a day. Because the law was, as soon as you can bail someone out, they can get out of jail. So there was this bus, 24 hours a day, and I would take the bus at three in the morning and interview everybody on the bus going to Rikers, and then interview everybody coming back from Rikers. And oh. then interview all the prostitutes and drug dealers 
at the bus stop because their clients were coming home. And it was just fascinating. That is a great idea. Yeah. And you see, if you hadn't gone where you weren't supposed to be, probably never would have happened. Right. And then people were like, why don't you let the people who do documentaries do this? Well, why should I? I did it. And then, and then Sheila Nevins, who was in charge of documentaries at HBO, right. she actually gave me money to shoot this as a pilot. She loved it so much. So now suddenly I skipped the line from, at that time, this was in the 90s again, there were two places for documentaries, Channel 13, which was boring, and yeah, HBO. Right. And Sheila Nevins had 160 Oscars to prove it. And a billion people would try to jump over the line to kill their mothers to get over the line to get money from you know, the head of documentaries at HBO to fund a documentary project. And yet I was able to do it. I skipped the line. And, and I realized over the years, so whether it was being a computer programmer, starting a company, making a documentary, being a hedge fund manager, being a day trader, being a chess master, poker player, stand-up comedian, writer, public speaker, all of these things had one thing in common, which is that every time someone told me, you can't do this, you can't skip the line, or don't think you know something just because you've been doing it for six months. You need to do this for 20 years like the rest of us before you could be talking to us. And these two things... While partially true, they're ma it makes sense. They're not really true if you own the fact that, hey, I want to get good at this. I'm going to figure out my unique voice. I'm going to learn all the micro skills required to get good at this. And I'm going to work really hard at it and do it because I love it. That's the important thing too, is you have to do what you love doing. I wouldn't have wanted interviewing people at three in the morning if I didn't love doing it. That's the, that's the whole point. But if I didn't love doing it, I would have found something else. As long as you keep experimenting with your life, you'll, you'll find things you love doing all the time, every day. And you're calling it experimenting with your life. The way I see it is you're simply following your curiosity. Yeah. You're following your curiosity. So like, I'm trying to think of a way to distinguish it from following your curiosity because they're very, they're very close and one kind of leads the other. But like, let's say um, well, I'll use stand-up comedy as an, as a reference. And I'll use that because people know what it is. Everybody's comfortable with who they like and who they don't like in terms of stand-up comedians. And I think it's acknowledged that it's a relatively difficult skill. And people would tell me, you can't be a stand-up comedian. It takes 20 years to be a professional stand-up comedian. Or they would say, oh, you're not, your one-liners are no good. Like you need to get better at those. And, or I would watch myself and I would see there's too much space. You know, I'd watch videos of myself and there's too much space between laughs. So I constructed an experiment to help me get better or at least learn. I went into a subway car and I would do stand-up comedy and I would switch cars every stop. So every minute or two, I'd have to switch cars and I would do stand-up comedy and see if I can get the crowd who hated me to laugh. <laughs> Nobody wanted to laugh on the subway car. So it was a real challenge. There's no way to fail an experiment like that, right? The worst that could happen is nobody laughs. That's a failure. If people laugh, that's interesting. Everything's just data. So what do I have to do to get someone who really doesn't care about me at all to laugh and to spark like a visceral organic laugh? And so that was one experiment. And whether it, whether it had succeeded or failed, it, it was an experiment that I did that made me better. And so my theory is, is that people talk about this so-called 10,000 hour rule, where if you put 10,000 hours into something, you'll be the best in the world. I don't believe that works at all, except for repetitive tasks, like memorizing a sequence of numbers. If you, if you do that for 10,000 hours, you'll memorize more numbers than someone who does it for 8,000 hours. But the 10,000 experiment rule, where you do 10,000 experiments following your curiosity, then you'll truly be the greatest at whatever you want to do. Because every experiment, you're going to learn something. Whether you fail or succeed, you're going to learn, no matter what. As you're talking, I'm just thinking, literally every time I have gone up in life, it's always because I've made a lateral step that lifted me. Yeah. Vertically. And it's proof of everything you're saying. Because if you just stay on the same line, eventually you're just going to top out 
and there, there's just going to be no more. No, you're right. Or what happens is I'm going to draw a learning curve, but the learning curve is very steep in the beginning, right? right? So if you're, if I, who didn't have any experience with basketball, wanted to learn how to play basketball, I would take some lessons from a pro or a champ or whatever, and then I'd play in some games. And the first thing I would learn really quickly is how to dribble without looking at the ground. Okay. Cause when I, <laughs> if I were to dribble basketball, I would look at the basketball, but you're supposed to not look at it. Right. And then I would learn how to run and shoot. And so that learning curve is going to be very steep, but at the top or near, well, let's say in the top 1%, which inc maybe includes 50,000 people, not just, we're not talking about the NBA, but the top 1% of basketball players is a good 50,000 or more people. So to be in the top 1%, you have all these basic skills, but at that point it gets really nuanced. So whoever is number 30,000, me on the street can't tell the difference between someone who's the 30,000th best basketball player in the world or the 50,000th. It's too nuanced for me. People can't really tell who's better, Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock. It's too nuanced. Dave Chappelle or somebody else, you know, you might not ever have heard of who has a Netflix special. Dave Chappelle might be clearly better among comedians, but the average person on the street has no way of determining. So it's really only important to do the things to get into that top 1% because you, you get the whole learning curve, you get all the basic skills. And then after that, no one can really tell. I can't, if you were to be really into cooking, I can't tell if you're a better cook or, uh, I don't know, Rachel Ray. I can't tell who the better chef is. I'm not a nuanced, I don't have a nuanced palate in a restaurant. I'm not a restaurant critic. There's no way for me to tell, but I, if you were in the top 1% of chefs, which would be probably a million people, there's no way for me to tell. Do you know why this works? Because excellence travels across a wide swath of territory because it's the same characteristics yes. that work wherever you go. And as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking of an interview I did not long ago with Michael Phelps, the greatest, some say the greatest athlete who ever lived. He's won all the Olympic medals as a swimmer, most decorated Olympian. And his life was basically a lane in a swimming pool. And he did it seven days a week. And his thinking was, well, if everybody else is doing it six days, then look how much more practice time I'm getting in. And now that would seem to go against what you're arguing, but at the same time, he was experimenting with his sleep and experimenting with his food uh, in order to get the most out of himself. So while he was in that lane to get the medals, and actually he wasn't even after the medals, he was competing with himself. He would put times on like the refrigerator on walls that he wanted to beat like three years down the road. And then he would drive himself to those times and he could actually win a gold medal, but not hit his time and be disappointed in himself. Yeah, I can believe it. And, and think about it like just in terms of sports where it feels like it's repetitive, but it's not. There's a lot of experimentation. Think about tennis. So pre-Boris Becker, we had John McEnroe, you had guys like Arthur Ashe. They were kind of thin guys, but they were the best tennis players in the world. Suddenly you had a guy who said, you know, what if I really spend a lot of my training, instead of doing repetitive, you know, serving and, and whatever, I'm going to lift weights. So Boris Becker bulked up and suddenly he was by far the best tennis player in the world. I might be getting my tennis no, history I, I wrong. I think Tiger Woods, same thing. Yeah, right. Like that guy's jacked and every other professional tennis player at the time, they were a little overweight. They were not necessarily, they didn't necessarily think being in athletic shape was the way to be an, an, an extremely good golf player. Yeah. Look at all the golf players before Tiger. A lot of those guys yeah. had nice bellies and uh, you go to a different direction. You take a step to the side and it changes everything. This is why I don't, this is another reason why the 10,000 hour rule never really added up for me is because as the players and coaches experiment, coaching techniques change. So what if you can take Boris Becker's coaching techniques and go back to the 1920s? Then 
trivially, you would be the best. Anybody, anybody training in tennis with the 1980s, 1990s tennis coaching techniques could probably be a top professional player from in the 1920s. Just because the coaching technique, you don't need 10,000 right. hours. You need 50 hours or, or a 1,000 uh, hours. But it's because of those experiments done over the ages that you realize what works and what doesn't. And, and again, you learn things from each one of them, whether they work or not. So let's say the weightlifting didn't work. You would learn from that. Like, oh, bulked you up too much, so you wasn't flexible. I don't know, I'm making it up. But uh, you would learn from that, that, okay, maybe the reverse, being more flexible. So stretching would have been the correct coaching technique. I mean, there was, um, in, in chess, Bobby Fischer is considered one of the, maybe the greatest chess player in all of history. So when he was, I believe it was like 12 or 13 years old, he was kind of a good, strong, amateur kid. Like he was in there, not nobody knew. He, he's, he's, he's strong. He's, he's a good kid. And he took a year off from playing and he disappeared. He, he's, actually, he's a little weird. He stopped going to school. He just disappeared. And he spent that year studying all the games played. This was in the 1950s. He, he spent a year studying all the games played by all the professional chess players in the 1800s. And for every game in the 1800s, he analyzed it so hard, he came up with an improvement in each game. And so when he came back to chess, he started playing these, what's considered classical or romantic openings from the romantic era of chess in the 1800s. And people were like, oh, we've, we've solved all of these. They they're all lead to draws. They don't lead to wins. But he had that improvement for oh, each game. Oh, they say no he, draw. He wiped out everybody forever. Like he never really lost after that. Like he, he was always, that started off his experimentation he was always experimenting in ways that people couldn't even think of. So kind of constructing these interesting experiments and seeing how they work. They could fail or succeed, but you're still going to learn. Every experiment is a learning experience. Why do you think so many people are scared to step out? I think because they have somebody above them who says you can't do it that way. You can't. Boy, you can't study the games from the 1800s. That will, those games we've already, we the experts have already determined they're draws. You can't win. You can't, Boris Becker, focus on practicing your serve a thousand more times. Don't go to the gym and lift weights. You're just going to slow yourself down. You're going to gain muscle weight. It's not going to do anything for you. So uh, it's the spin is everything. That That's what gets the power to your head. So they would tell these things to, to the guys who eventually became the best in the world. Is part of that a sense of control from the person at the top? Like, I'm the boss here. Let me tell you how to do it. I think that's partially it. So part of the, one of the techniques, I think, in skipping the line is learning how to kind of negotiate past that. How do you get to Sheila Nevins when you're at the bottom <laughs> rung at HBO? You, they're just starting a website. Uh, how do you, like figure out, you know what, I want to talk to the CEO today. How do you then, do you just say, I'm going? Or do you think about it? Do you plan it? Do you say to yourself, uh-oh, this could get me in trouble with this person or that person? Well, a little bit of both because a, 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 so a great example might be HBO, but this could work in any any situation. And by the way, let's say I didn't get to the CEO or let's say I was blocked at the door. That's okay. That was an experiment. Now I try 50 other experiments. That's one experiment that maybe worked, but there might've been people I tried to talk to where it didn't work, but you learn from that. But in that particular case, you do prepare a little bit. So I happen to have known the entire history of HBO. So I knew when they first beamed up the, the, the signal to the satellite to spread all over the country. I knew when uh, Michael Fuchs decided, you know what, instead of just buying movies at HBO, which is, was their business model, Let's air through our satellite signal a pay-per-view boxing match and make money that way. So that was the first original program. I knew the evolution of original programming. I knew when they when Showtime started um, going door to door in Mississippi, and John and and John Billick, the head of who became the head of marketing at HBO, when he was going door to door in Mississippi, he also introduced a new product. Cinemax, because then when you had two things to offer instead of one, you're going to win. So I knew the history of Cinemax. And then I learned how original programming became such a, par a large part of their profits. So I'm able to go in and, and ask the CEO, hey, can I ask your advice? If I want to do an idea like this original web programming, just like you, Jeff, 
to do original TV program and it's so successful. Do you think on the HBO website I could do this and it would be, and we could try it? And he's like, how is he going to say no to that? Because I knew the history inside and out. Wow. Boy, you just made the best case imaginable for a company knowing its history, for the employees to know what happened before. It's so important. You have to feel that you're speaking. If I'm speaking to the CEO of HBO and I'm presenting an idea, I can't be this little kid in the IT department. It's 27. I can't be this little kid in the IT department. I have to be speaking with the voice of HBO at that moment. So in order to do that, I have to know their whole history. I have to know the history. By that point, I had had lunch with all the secretaries of everybody. So I knew the histories of all the executives and I knew how, what the culture was that developed and how people took the next step and how HBO was much more experimental than the average fortune 500 company with billions of profits. So I, I knew to take those chances. Sometimes I've tried to do this and it's failed, but then I would experiment again. Like one time, one time I made a lot of money. I sold a business and then I went dead broke. I've told the story a million times. So I was dead broke. I didn't know how to find the opportunities. And so I did the only thing I could do. I wrote a letter to Warren Buffett and I said to Warren Buffett in this letter, Warren or Mr. Buffett, I'm a big admirer of yours. Uh, I'd love to fly to Omaha and take you out for a cup of coffee for just 20 minutes to ask you some questions. He did not answer because <laughs> who am I? Like he did not <laughs> give a crap who this guy was, who is going to treat him to a cup of coffee. He's got $60 billion. He doesn't need a cup of coffee from me. He's not like Gladys. I, I don't know what his secretary's name is. Gladys, hold all phone calls. This, <laughs> James is coming. James to, is coming to coming town. To Omaha. <laughs> And, and so then I figured, you know what? I, that, I, I sort of realized that when I thought about that and he was one among 30 emails I had sent and nobody responded. And so what I not did was one out of 30, people. not one out of 30 responded. I, and to all of them, I said the same thing. I would love to pick your brain. I'm a huge fan. I was very complimentary. Did you let him know that where you were and that you'd lost everything or no, did, I didn't do didn't? that. Well, no, but, but see, I, that might have gotten people to maybe, respond. Maybe, but I did. I would say I've been a CEO of a company. I've sold it. I've been an investor or a day trader, but I wasn't doing well. I mean, I, I was not doing well at that time as an investor and I had sold a company in the internet boom like everyone else who had started a company then. So nobody, 30 emails, zero people responded. So I went back and I said, what did I do wrong? Because, you know, I must have, I, that was an experiment. Sending an email to Warren Buffett's an experiment, but you have to, it's not a failure or, or, or at the very least, you need to learn from the failures. So what I did wrong was I didn't provide any value. I didn't, it's not... And then sometimes people- Yeah, you're just saying, hey, can I sit down and yeah. take your wisdom right. for a cup of coffee? And then the next step would be to say, hey, do you need someone to help you with something? But that's not good either because now I just, I'm giving, let's say I wrote that to Warren Buffett. Now I'm giving him a homework assignment. Hey, I'm here. What do I what, need? Where's my I desk? <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> what, what, what do you have me working on today? <laughs> like he, he doesn't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. So what I did instead was I went through each of the 30 and I, I researched them. Like one guy, I read his PhD from 1962 and had jotted down some comments and thoughts on it. Another person I wrote software for based on what I thought was his model of investing. Another person was a big um, financial news writer. I came up with 10 ideas of articles he should write. And then I wrote an email to each person. And I said, I don't want anything at all, but I'm an, I'm an admirer. I've looked at your this, this, this. Here's 10 things I think that could help you. You don't even have to respond to me. Good luck. Goodbye. And three people now did respond to me. So still most people said did it, said nothing. They didn't even say no. But 10%. Right? And one person started me off. So he said, uh, uh, this is Jim Cramer. He said, these ideas are so great. Why don't you write them? And I started writing professionally at that point. And that was what set off the blog? That's what set off my financial writing. Yeah, because I had been writing fiction for like 12 years before then, but getting nowhere. And suddenly now for the first time, someone was willing to pay me to write an article. And I started writing for the street.com. Then that led to the financial times, uh, the wall Street journal, the exact that, setup. That's there. my first five books were finance books. So that, that one letter started my whole writing career to this day. And then I switched to writing more, um, let's call it narrative nonfiction or memoirs, self-help type books. 
it all started from that letter, which I rewrote and sent and researched and sent to him. And the art ideas I sent him were legit good ideas for articles that I felt comfortable writing. And I said to him, if you write these articles, I will, sub they'll be so good that I will tell all my friends to subscribe. Like, I think these are great articles and I'd love to hear your opinion. And he said, he wrote, he wrote back, like I said, he said, these are great ideas. How about you write them? And then I had, I didn't know how the world works. Editors are slow. Three or four months later, they got back in touch with me and said, okay, when can you write a letter for an article for tomorrow? And started me off. First, I framed that check for the first article I ever wrote. And then four years later, by the way, I sold a company to Jim Cramer for $10 million. And I signed, had him sign the back of that $200 check for my first article. So that one letter led to a lot of things. I went broke after selling that business. So that's another story. And then another article I wrote, I wrote to a really great hedge fund manager that I admired. I knew he had a software style. So I wrote 10 pieces of software for, um, I said, look, this seems like your quantitative style. Here are some algorithms that you might not have looked at. I'm happy. You could just have them. I'm happy to train your programmers if they have any questions. And he wrote back, this is great. Would love to meet you. And we met for a couple of times. I met his wife and they allocated their personal money to me. And that was the first time I ever raised money. And so now I started a hedge fund, started me in the hedge fund business. And I think I returned in a year, 130% on their money, which essentially they were already wealthy, but that was enough to- 130%. Yeah, it did very well. My software was doing very well. And he was the one also, I, I, I also had read his like 1960s PhD thesis and had- comments on it and really researched this person. So that's how I sort of gave myself permission and at the same to write. And at the same time, I didn't ask for anything back. I, I, I did not. Sometimes ask you need to nothing. ask, ask for nothing. Yeah. Sometimes you need to ask, but, but try as hard as possible to put off the ask until you build the relationship. The ask is sort of just the boat on the, on the river of that relationship that you build. You know, I know somebody, tell me how this fits into mm -hmm. your philosophy, who got a job. There was a magazine that was starting up, and I guess the first issue would come out, and he wrote a critique of the first issue. Oh, that's great. And instead of saying, oh, I really like this, uh, that is great, he just like ripped <laughs> through it and made really good points and he got hired. Yeah. That is a brilliant technique. So you always want to go to the room least crowded. So of the people writing reviews of that magazine who also wanted a job at that magazine, probably zero of them were saying this magazine is awful. Here's what you need to do. And I'm not saying he said it exactly like that. I'm sure he was much more smooth, but he was probably the one person out of a thousand applying for a job there that was critical. And here's the important thing. This is a very important skip the line technique. You have to find your unique voice. So for instance, I know a guy who's in stand-up comedy. He's moving up through the ranks really fast. He's skipping line. 27 is very young because a lot of these guys just take Dave Chappelle or Louis C.K., any of these people. Louis C.K. is a great example. He didn't really break out until he had been doing it for about 28 years. So wow. he wasn't 27 years old. He'd right. already been doing comedy for 28 years before he, people knew who his, who his name was. So this guy, this kid right now, he's 27 years old. His name's Chris Turner. He's, gr he's good at stand-up, you know, good, bad, doesn't even matter. He's good at stand-up. Um, but what he does that's unique is at the end of a set, he'll ask all the different parts of the audience, hey, give me a word, give me a word, give me a word. And they'll throw out random words like, uh, volcanoes or phrases, volcanoes on Venus, Wimbledon, uh, the Doppler <laughs> effect. Uh, and then he's like, okay, okay. And then immediately without even thinking about it, he says, DJ, uh, hit that beat. And the beat starts going. And he immediately does this freestyle rap about those five words, but he's not, and it's not like he's just rhyming words. It's like, he's talking about the science of volcanoes on Venus in this rap. He's talking about <laughs> the ambulance starts off here and then it goes down the street and the Doppler effect, you know, and he's, he's oh, explaining I it. See it. it all over YouTube, just Chris Turner, freestyle rap. And that's a unique co comedic voice. So now every single comedy club in the world, the doors are open to him. He skipped the line. Like n he went to the room least yeah. crowded. There's nobody else doing nobody that. else doing that. And like the comedy seller is the hardest comedy club in New York city to format. 
Nobody can perform there. He can just walk right in. Um, he'll just say, hey, make some room for me. I mean, he does not, he's not this arrogant, but he could say this. Make some room for me, and they'll they'll put him up at the close just to just to do that. And you know, he's his career set because he found his unique voice. Again, think about tennis. Boris Becker's unique voice was to work out, whereas everybody else go to the room least crowded. Yeah. There were no tennis players, but yeah, we're, lived in ways. Uh, Bobby Fischer was playing games from the 1800s. Um, wow, I'm trying to think. And, and go you know, to the room least crowded. And you know, if you go, if you do sales. In an office, let's just take it back down to like wherever, you know, somebody works a sales job, you know, figure out a way to do sales. It's not just in the playbook. Like maybe there's something unique, like look up the, you, you know, a lot of people now are using sales combining AI. Like there's ways to use AI to kind of figure out who you're talking to a little bit better. Or, um, I don't know, even me as a programmer, uh, when I was a, just a computer junior computer programmer, I did some things that were different than how other people were doing things and you rise up really quickly. I'll get, that's too technical. I won't get into the weeds of that story, but, or as an investor, people, people run out of ideas and then there's no more ways to get extra money in the market, but you have to come up with your own unique vision of how the world works or how your field works. And you'll skip the line. Uh, being a college, applying to college after you're a professional NASCAR driver, that's a unique voice. You skip the line if you love it. Um, it's all going to the room least crowded or even empty. Yeah. Look at uh, Andrew Yang. He dropped out of the presidential race, but he had a rabid following because he created this appearance of someone who was the only one who, under who was not a politician, who seemed to understand how new technology was going to affect the economy. He had his own unique vision of the world. So he didn't win, but the experiment wasn't a failure. He got, he raised tens of millions of dollars. He has this huge rabbit. Like they love him. He, Joe Biden was crushing him in the polls, but, but Andrew Yang's audience, their love for Andrew Yang, like exceeded every thermometer for any other candidate. You know what? It would be really interesting. We should get him on a, on a podcast. The two of us sit down. Believe me, him. I've tried. Let's, I really? have his phone yeah, number really? in my book. We texted back and forth. Because that is a phenomenal podcast. I'll leave it to you since you started. But no, I'll, I, I'll have them both. I'll, I'll, I'll have you I, in for I that. I would like to know what he learned running for president. It's interesting because he commented a little bit on it today because everyone was saying, oh, now he should run for mayor of New York. And by the way, I had a candidate for mayor on my podcast, so it would be interesting to see what happens. But people are saying, oh, you should run for mayor, you should run for this, you should run for that. And it does seem like he learned that, okay, getting out a little bit earlier than he could have, he could have gone another few primaries, um, you know, cutting his losses on this, on this massive experiment they did of running for president. He did better than he thought he would. And now he's got, he's got this asset. He's got these fans who love him and he's got tens of millions in his pack or campaign committee or whatever. He can do something now. He's created a new career and life for himself. He's got many directions to go. And I, I think, though, what he learned about politics, which he talks about, is that he likes somebody with executive experience, not legislative. So someone who's run things. And he's, he's commented on that. But I don't know what he's learned about campaigning. Yeah, I would like to know what he's learned about speaking to people. Yeah. Very basic things. And I guarantee you that he would be able to sit down for an hour, hour and a half, and tell you things you, you never would have imagined. Yeah. Just because he stepped to the side and went on that experience and now he's a different person yeah no you're 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 right i'm sure it's amazing and that's and again i'm not criticizing everyone else we're told from birth just follow the line don't skip it or bad things will happen yeah get in line don't yeah. cut the line yeah and then, and then there's a lot of people who are higher in line who will resent you if you try to cut the line right like i'm sure all the people who would love to perform at I don't know, the comedy seller, they don't like it when Chris Turner just walks in at the age of 27 and they're like, I hope, I've been here for 40 years. You, why aren't you giving me a spot? And you're giving this kid just walks in and you're giving him a spot. They don't like it. The people off top don't like it. By the way, the people at the bottom don't like it either. How did he, I'm, they always think I'm better than him. How did he get to the front of the line? Oh, it's that, it's that thing he does. But like, they don't. He, but he stepped to the side. Yeah. He, 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 you know, and he did that, that unique thing. First off, he, he learned all the basic skills and he was very focused on that. And he also learned, he also had his unique passion. He's been 
freestyle rapping since he was a kid and just coming up with rhymes. So he combined the two and boom, he's in front. It's not like he, it's not like, oh gosh, I really hate rapping, but I'm going to have to do it to succeed. He loved rapping too. You see what you did to me, James? Oh man, what a close, what a close. And then, you know, even, <laughs> even with me, I would say, so I've been public speaking for 20 years, but when I started doing stand up, I was like, oh no, I thought, I thought public speaking would trans, and I was always a very funny public speaker. I thought that would translate into doing stand up comedy. It didn't at all. By the way, it translates in the reverse. If you're good at stand up comedy, you could be a great public speaker, but a great public speaker has nothing to do with being good at stand up comedy. It took me a while to finally go all full circle. And now the I only will joke about something if I really care about it. So a lot of comedians, they have like their set up punchline. Oh, I went on a Tinder date last night and then this happened, <laughs> you know, and, but now I'll talk about the exact same things, entrepreneurship, college, uh, what's going on in the world. Well, you know, why are people believing all this BS self-help? I talk about the exact same things I've been talking about for 20 years, but now I finally, now I'm, because I'm always been the expert at my thing, now that I bring it into comedy, it's propelled me up suddenly in the past six months. Now I'm all over the world doing stand up from by finding my own unique voice. Okay, James, you've just thrown it down to me, you know, and I realized I, as a speaker, I want moments where I can be funnier and I should step outside of where I'm at and study comedy and see what it does to me. Uh, you know, it's interesting because even after just a few months of doing comedy, I would not say I was, uh, a, I was again, I was funny, but I wasn't a good stand-up comedian in, in the and how I think of it. But then I had to do a talk and boom, I realized, oh my gosh, this is like a superpower now for public speaking. Like I had a, this, amazing this, abilities. This, this is the my whole point. Whatever happens, I know if I step to the side, it's going to lift me up somehow. Right. Whatever, and I'll, I'll put it a different way. Whatever experiment you do and that you learn Don't from- Don't expect to see me in the subways, but- <laughs> <laughs> no, but but it, but by the way, it wasn't the humor part that helped me with public speaking. It was the ability to understand, to see much more clearly what everybody in the crowd is thinking, and 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 then oh, navigate through that. That's my point. Yeah, that's my whole point. You don't know what you're going to learn unless you take that step to the side. You go to the least crowded room, and I'm so grateful for you to spend this. Every time I sit down with you. I come out of the room a different person. By the way, we didn't even touch kind of how you build up the 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 meta skills of learning anything because there's all of that, but that we could say that for another time. But I'll just tell you one story. Uh, so I went, I did some public speaking after doing, I was doing stand-up maybe a year at this point. And I did something I never had done before in public speaking, um, which is I went to the crowd and I said, I could talk about, X, Y, or Z. And I named topics for X, Y, or Z. And I'm going to say the thing, and then I want you to clap, and then I'll talk about whatever you clap the loudest for. So I said X, Y, and Z. Of course, they clapped the loudest for Z because I knew they were going to do that. There's something called recency bias. They're always going to clap for the last thing you offer. So I, that was the talk I had prepared. But because I made <laughs> them feel they had the choice, they kind of had to like my talk. And then they also feel like they're interacting with me, that they were cre we're creating this together. So it worked really well. And then at any point, if I felt the talk lag a little bit, I would say, okay, let's go back. You know, Y, uh, Z, X. I knew they were going to pick X and now I could go into that. And boom, and it changed that public talk that people still write to me about that talk from four years ago. And Well, anytime you have somebody writing to you about something you did four years ago, you know you're at, a high level. And that and that was an experiment. Like I didn't know what would happen if I gave these choices. It's a little scary to do every experiment. Well, I leave here a scared man, but I'm going to step out, take a step out and see where this takes me. It's one thing I never thought I would do, but I'm going to try and get funnier because <laughs> of today. Because of you. Which is not you you can be funny without being good at Stand-up comic. No, I, I can be a complete failure as a stand-up comic, but if I'm funnier when I speak because yes. of my attempt, then that's 
what's going to make me happy. Yeah. Because that's really all I want in the first place. I don't, I'm not trying to be Jerry Seinfeld. Right. That's the same thing with me either. Like I, I had no goals with it. I just wanted to get the skills because it was, it seemed like really difficult skills. Like I was already funny, but this was a different skill. And so I just, I wanted to get good at it. And so I experimented as hard as possible so that I could skip the line with it. See, you were already funny. I have to learn how to be funny. You're funny, Cal. I don't think so. But I like to laugh. That's the key part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see where this takes us. Thank you so much, James. It's and then, really beautiful. No, no problem, Cal. Next time, come on mine, and we'll go back and forth on what experiments we've tried and how they've, they've worked out. Okay. Let's get Andrew Yang to sit yeah. down with us. All right. All right. Andrew, you listening? I will. Do we have his phone number around. We could just say his phone number on the, on the air. Could <laughs> I have his phone number on my phone somewhere? But I don't. I don't know I, where it is. I, I'm. I guarantee you that's going to be a fascinating hour. Yeah. If you if you really plumb down, like beyond all the things that you have read about or seen, to understand what he actually took out of the experience yeah. for himself. That'd be fascinating. That's phenomenal. Yeah. And I feel the same way with Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah. She went through something there in that election. Like it was like deep state global politics. Like suddenly she was like Russia's pawn and this Let, and that. Let's, let's get Tulsi too. And she, she and Jocko were just on Joe Rogan's podcast, which was interesting. So that was an interesting triumvirate for a podcast. There you go. All right, let's see what we're gonna just step to the side, see where this takes us. Yeah, thanks, Kyle, and good luck. Or I also challenge us both to experiment with the formats of our podcast, and let's see what happens. All right, we're going to be together again soon. I feel excellent. All Thank right. you, Kyle. Thanks for having me on. Cheers, brother. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.